Hello again. My name is Keith Mosier. I'm an instructor at the Memphis School of Preaching, and we have been privileged for quite a while now to be studying the Messianic prophet Isaiah. And we come today to the end of his written prophecy, and we are going to be discussing in detail the Messianic efforts to build his church and his righteousness on this earth. And in chapter 61, verse 7, we have a statement about the work of God in all of this effort to bring Messiah to the world. And this effort of God, this work of God, is said to be a work of justice, verse 7, because God loves justice. He rejoices in it. He will bring them out of their captivity in Babylon, and He will bring them back to Palestine. And in Palestine, He will keep His promise, God will, that God made to Abram in the long ago, that in Palestine, Abram's seed would come to bless the entire world. A work of justice, the hypocrisy of the people, and that word robbery in verse 8 is something God does not like. It's actually the word hypocrisy. God does not like that. This hypocrisy will be turned to justice. The hypocrisy of Judaism will be turned to an everlasting covenant when the Messiah comes. And God will bring it in justice. Then in chapter 62, we have Messiah mentioned as God speaks. And the first three verses are God speaking of chapter 62. And we have the Messiah here spoken by God as one who will not keep silent anymore. God is going to do His thing in history. He's not going to hold back, and Messiah will come, and the Gentiles, the entire world, will see this righteous act of God, verse 2. And all kings, thy glory, the leaders of the world will know that one has come. It's interesting to me that every time someone signs his check and puts the date 2020 on it, that person is acknowledging the coming of Messiah. That's his date in history. And he, of course, is in charge of history. And the Gentiles will be those brought in. And thou shalt be called by a new name. The people of God will no longer be called Jews. They will no longer be called Gentiles. They will even have a name better than sons and daughters. They will have the name Christian, a name given by God in the very church at Antioch in Syria, in the long ago, when the Apostle Paul came there, that inspired Apostle, and the disciples were called, Kremitidzo, God called, Christians first at Antioch, Acts 11, 26. And so we will be called by a new name, a new name that fits all of God's people who follow Messiah. They will be Christ's people. They will be Christians. Somebody took the acrostic Christ, I-A-N, Christ's I am now. I am now a Christian, a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. It has been said by some that the name Christian was given by the enemies of Christ and the enemies of His church. But in reality, it's a God-called name. It's a brand new name, a name that was given by almighty and divine inspiration. And Messiah will be a crown of glory to the world and the Christians in it will be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, 1 Peter 2.9. And a royal diadem in the hand of God, he says here, and Isaiah does, in predicting the kind of people who will be called Christians. Uh, they won't be forsaken anymore. And that word forsaken uh, could be translated as uh, desolate. Uh, they will be called uh, no longer widows, desolate, or forsaken, shimorach. They won't be without God anymore. They will be called hefzibah. They will be called the lap of the Lord. And thy land shall be called Beulah land, married land. Interesting words here, referring to those who become Christians as being married to the Lord, no longer widows or desolate, no longer left out or forsaken, 
but royal people. Isaiah used this word translated desolate at Isaiah 49:19, and Ezekiel used it at Ezekiel 36:35. And in both cases, the prophets were referring to a widow, as if Israel had become a widow without a husband. But now she can be married to Christ, and no longer will she be forsaken. She will be Beulah Land. The next time we sing the song Beulah Land, we're talking about being married to Christ. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. Paul picked up on this illustration of the bride of Christ, Ephesians 5, beginning at verse 22. And he likened the marriage of a Christian to Christ in the same vein as a man married to a woman married to a man. And he has the man in the marriage loving his wife as much as Christ loved his bride. You remember on one occasion that Saul of Tarsus was attacking the bride of Christ. He was pulling people into prison. He was having some of them put to death. And the Lord stopped him on the road to Damascus and knocked Saul down, literally, with a great light. And Brother Keeble used to say about that, that when someone messes with the bride, he gets knocked down by the husband. We are the bride of Christ in the new covenant. That's God's promise. And Isaiah said it 700 years before it happened, that we would be taken in. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. We have spiritual mates when we become Christians. We have a spiritual husband, a spiritual father, a spiritual guide through the Word of God by the Holy Spirit. We have all of the relationships needed to go to heaven. It's a great thing to be Beulah land, to be married to Christ. Now, in History, God said, I've set some protectors in place. Look at verse 6 of chapter 62. I have set watchmen, watchdogs, protectors upon thy walls, O Jerusalem. I'm putting this all together, God says, and I'm protecting it. And there are protectors on the walls which shall never hold their peace day or night, as Isaiah, as Ezekiel, as Jeremiah, all of those who came to project for history the coming of Messiah. They're called watchmen. Ye that make mention of the Lord, don't keep silence. It's no longer necessary to be quiet about this. We're unveiling the mystery. God intends to bring the whole world into one church. So let's not keep silent. Give Him to no rest till He establish. You keep praying to God until all of this is accomplished. Don't worry about it at all in terms of it's going to be done, but you keep praying about it, verse 7, till he make Jerusalem a praise on the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand, his right arm, and surely I will no more give thy grain to be food for thine enemies, and the sons of the strangers shall not drink thy wine for that the which thou hast labored. But they that have gathered it shall eat it. One of these days when you come out of captivity, Judah, all of these blessings will come to you. What's unfortunate here is that when the Messiah did come, they did not recognize him for the most part. That's sad. Here's Isaiah telling them what he's going to be like, and they don't recognize him. He came to bring the blessing, and they don't see it. And they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. Go through, go through the gates, prepare you the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Get everything ready. Messiah's coming. Well, Isaiah, you keep telling us we're going into captivity, the Jews would say. Yes, but there's a purpose in it. There's a historical purpose. Whatever we're going through in history, it has a purpose. It's not being done unnecessarily. There is a purpose. Go through, so get ready. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye to the daughter of Jerusalem, Tell Jerusalem, 
the daughter of Zion, excuse me, behold, thy salvation cometh, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He's coming. Isaiah's pointing toward his coming. And he came, the king of Israel, the king of the world, the prince of peace. He's coming. Get ready. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called, sought out a city, not forsaken. Beulah land. When he comes, we'll be married to him. And all the world will have opportunity, Jew and Gentile, to be brought into the great church of Christ. Well, who's going to do this? Well, Messiah's coming, chapter 62. Who is he? He's the conqueror. Chapter 63, who is this that cometh from red, Edom? Someone's coming in history and it's all red. With dyed garments from Basrach, the capital of Edom. With dyed garments, red garments. Who is this in red garments? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness. The question is answered. Who is this? Messiah, the conqueror. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. It's possible that we have a reference here to the bloodiness of his crucifixion. Or just the idea of he's bright red in history. But his mission, let's find out what Isaiah meant when he said he's coming in red garments. Because the next verse asks the question, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Why are you pictured in red? Watch. Messiah answered, I have tread the winepress alone. I'm the only one that looks like this in history. I'm the only one covered with the redness of my mission. I'm of the opinion this has to be a reference to his crucifixion. And of the people there was none with me. I'm the only one that did this, and he's the only one who could die on that cross for our sins. And the bloodiness of that cross, the redness of that event, it's hard to picture it in words. The crown of thorns on his head and all the blood flooded, flooding down his face. The nails, the scourging, the scourging was enough to kill him, and yet all we have is one sentence. Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, John 19, 1. I can read that sentence in just a second or two. But what was going on there when that Roman soldier beat his back and beat it open so that blood was everywhere? And you remember that they put the robe on him after that and then took it off like ripping a bandage off of an open wound, is it not? All of that blood. And then when he was already dead, a soldier pierced his side and forthwith there came out blood and water, the precious blood of Christ. The precious blood of Christ. He did it all alone. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. He did it for us. And I will stain all my raiment. This is the anger of divine judgment. Put on Christ. When God's justice was ameliorated, it was done by the Lord. When God's justice demanded, it was done by the Lord. No one else could do it. God's anger at the sin of man was ameliorated by the Christ. But he had another mission. 
Not only did he have the mission of bringing salvation, look at verse 4. He had a mission of vengeance. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. Two missions. Either you accept his gift on the cross and obey the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, by repenting and being baptized for the remission of your sins. Either you do that and you are redeemed, or God will take vengeance because of what His Son had to go through. God will take vengeance. And Messiah now speaks in history. And He says, I looked. Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. But there wasn't possible. So Messiah says, I look, and there was none to help. Nobody else could do this. I heard a preacher say on one occasion that God could have saved us any way He wanted to save us, but He decided to send His Son. Oh no, there was no one else that could do it. When that perfect man, Adam, sinned in the garden, God's justice demanded a perfect man as the atonement. To meet the justice of God, we had to have a perfect man die. It had to be. The Messiah is saying here, I looked, but there was no one else to help. Nobody else could do this. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. God's anger at sin upheld His promise. What a picture that is, that God is so angry at sin that He's willing to send His Son to take care of the problem. Sometimes we get a call by a church to come and help them resolve a conflict. In reality, it is impossible to resolve a conflict. In order to resolve it, we would have to wipe out the memories of everyone involved in the conflict. It's not possible. The greatest problem man has ever had is sin. And that problem was never resolved by God. But God did reconcile it. He reconciled it through His Son. And so the next time there's a conflict in the church or a conflict in your family or a conflict in society, we need to reconcile it. How is that done? I forgive you, you forgive me, we don't bring it up again. We're reconciled. God forgave us through the blood of His Son. He reconciled the problem. He brought us to Him and forgave us, and He won't bring it up again. The problem isn't resolved. Sin is still there. But it's reconciled. And that's what we do with all conflicts. If we're adult about it, if we're Christian about it, we reconcile it. And that's exactly what God did by sending the one in the red for our sins. And God also took care of the problem of those who stayed in sin, because the picture of the cross is one of redemption and also vengeance. We need to remember that the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ has to be obeyed, or God will take vengeance on us. I will tread down the people in my anger, make them drunk with my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. The cross has two messages, salvation or eternal damnation. I would beg you to pay attention to the first one. You look to the cross, my friend. You allow someone to bury you so you can be risen with Christ and walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3 and 4. God is now praised by Isaiah. Isaiah stops for a moment, and by inspiration, he praises God for all of this effort in history. Listen to Isaiah. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord, 
according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us, and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies, and according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. For he said, Surely they are my people. God didn't forget Israel. He allowed them to hear about salvation even before it ever took place. Children that will not lie, so he was their Savior. The Jew and the Gentile in one church. In all their affliction, he took their place. He was afflicted. And the messenger of his presence saved them. The messenger of his presence, John 10, 16, a reference to Messiah. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them and he carried them all the days of old. God had a purpose in all of the history of Judaism. And when the fullness of time came, God brought forth his son, born of a woman, but born under the law, Galatians 4.4. 4. And here's the sad news, and Isaiah knew it. And I've often wondered what he thought when he had to write this next verse, this next sentence. When he had to tell the people of his day that when Messiah comes, your descendants, most of them will rebel and vex the Holy Spirit of God. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. How did God's Holy Spirit, how was it troubled? According to Nehemiah 9, 20, he spoke to them, God did, through his Holy Spirit, through the prophets, as they, in Nehemiah 9, 30. So when they rebelled against whatever the prophets said, it vexed God's Holy Spirit. The message was there. They turned against it. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people saying, watch what happens when people rebel against God who are supposed to be his covenant people. Isaiah stops for a moment and reminds his people how they really think. Where is he that brought them up out of the sea? These people who are in trouble now and going into captivity are actually telling God, well, why don't you save us the way you did when you brought us out of Egypt? Because they rebelled. We have said over and over again in this study of Messiah, of Messiah and the study of Isaiah, that these people to whom Isaiah wrote were going into captivity and there was no escaping that fact. Even if they had done right after they were so evil, had they repented, they were still going into captivity. There was a consequence to their sin that God had to correct. But the people were thinking, well, if you're going to bring Messiah through us, why don't you save us like you did when you brought us out of Egypt? They weren't so rebellious when they were brought out of Egypt. They became rebellious afterwards out in the wilderness. And they have a history, these people do, of being rebellious. And they certainly rejected the Christ when he came, John 1, 11 and 12. And so they are pictured here as asking God, why don't you save us like you did in days of old? Well, where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? Numbers eleven seventeen. We have the message of Moses, who was inspired, and he told us about your bringing us out of captivity in Egypt. Why not bring us out of this or not even send us into it? Save us now. God has to tell them, you're not that special. I'm going to use you all right, but you're going into captivity. Well, didn't you bring us across the Red Sea once? Look at verse 12. That led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. Think of what's being said here. Messiah is coming with salvation. And Messiah is going to pay a huge price. He's going to be pictured in red, blood red, in order to do this. But the people are thinking, well, if that's the case, why not save us now? 
Don't punish us for our sins now. Don't let us go into captivity now. Just save us now. You remember, God, you, you did divide the Red Sea. Worldly sorrow is what this is. They're very sorry they got caught, and they're asking God to get them out of the dilemma. The true follower of God never thinks like that. Wherever he is, whatever he's in, whatever state he finds himself, he prays for endurance. Not release, endurance. Study the book of Acts and watch the people of God pray for endurance as they are being persecuted. They don't pay, pray for release. They know it's all part of God's purpose and God's plan. and So they pray for endurance. These people want out. They don't want to be part of all of this history. Even though God is actually in the person of the second being of the Godhead, coming out of heaven to save them, they still want out. They think incorrectly. We want out. No. Sin has consequences. If you'll obey God, you'll be able to endure it. When the Apostle Paul was in prison, he never wrote one time, Father, get me out of here. He talked about how it was working out to the salvation of even those around him, his bonds were. He asked people not to be ashamed of the fact that he was in prison. I, personally, was arrested on one occasion for preaching the truth in the very city called Washington, D.C., in the United States. I prayed for those who arrested me that they would hear the message I was preaching. They eventually figured out they had no right to do that and uncuffed me and let me go. But God says to me, Keith, don't pray for I want release. Somehow you're in a situation, use it. Very difficult. And it was awfully hard, evidently, for these Jews who were corrupt anyway and hypocrites, as we've already studied. And now they're thinking, well, God, if this is your purpose to bring Messiah, why not just let us go now? Save us now. But God will not do that. Well, God, didn't Moses lead us the way you would lead a beast into a valley? It was, was good leadership under Moses. Well, God, here's our prayer now then. They want Him to look down from heaven, verse 15. They want Him to look from the place where He lives that's so holy, And they want him to be asking, where is thy zeal and thy strength? God, won't you do something and get us out of this situation? And look at the question, where is your strength, God? Can you imagine asking God what happened to his strength? Why can't you save us? Sounds like the atheist, doesn't it? If God is so good, why is there evil in the world? Why doesn't God just take care of it? The answer is that God does not deal in the interruption of our free will. He made us that way. His strength is there. Then they want to know, where is your compassion and mercy? Did you hold them back? They're telling God, you're holding back your mercy from us. Why don't you deliver us? What questions are these? They're from hypocrites. Prayer by people for deliverance from sin and suffering when they brought it on themselves. How much an illustration of worldly sorrow that is. And then they try to, excuse the expression, butter up God. 
Doubtless thou art our father, though through Abraham be, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. O thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. O Lord, why hast thou made us to err? And now they blame God for their error. And hardened our hearts from thy fear. And they ask God to come back because we're the tribe of your inheritance. You cannot read any more illustrations that will emphasize hypocrisy more than these verses right here. We are thine. Thou never bearest rule over them, the Gentiles. They were not called by thy name. God, we're your people. Why are you going to bless the whole world and not bless us? But they are part of the blessing when Messiah comes. But their hypocrisy is such that evidently they don't want to be part of it. And now Isaiah stops all of this. And having recorded the thoughts of the people who had just been told Messiah's coming and he's going to have to sacrifice to do it, and yet they wanted God to deliver them from their problems. Isaiah, having just written that, now confesses what's really going on. Watch. Verse chapter 64. God, as Isaiah says, rend the heavens, come down, that the mountains might flow down as thy presence, and as when the melting fire burneth, the fire causes the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine enemies, that the nations may tremble at thy presence, Isaiah, that's not possible. I don't know if he means that the Judeans are, his, are Isaiah's enemies, or if he's talking for the Judeans thinking about their enemies, but you don't bring fire down on your enemies. James and John tried that with a village that didn't please them. And the Lord told them they didn't know what manner of man they were. Men they were. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the ear. I have seen, O God, beside thee what he prepared for him that waiteth for him. God, we don't understand this coming gospel. We don't get it. So why don't you bring down fire on our enemies? Here, Isaiah says, here's the problem. God meets those that rejoice and work righteousness, not those who ask for vengeance on their enemies. God meets those that work righteousness and remember Him in their ways. They live their lives for Him. And then Isaiah confesses finally, God, we know why you're angry. Behold our wrath, we have sinned. Verse 5, in those is continuance, in those things that God does in meeting righteousness, in those things that God does in remembering those who walk in His ways, in those things is continuance and salvation. We have to stop and say we admire Isaiah for finally admitting, which he's done before really, but this time with such emphasis, how sinful the people were. And Isaiah knew that God had prepared something that he did not yet understand. Paul will pick up on this, 1 Corinthians 2.9, and remind the people of his day that when Isaiah wrote, he didn't understand the fullness of the mystery, the unveiling of the gospel of Christ that the Jew and the Gentile were going to be in one church and all of those things. Because I had not seen here, had not heard, neither had entered into the mind of man the things that God had prepared back then for those that love Him. And those things did not come and were not revealed until the church started on Pentecost in A.D. 30. And so it is the case that Isaiah knew what the problem was. And for apostate Israel, 
there was a situation they can obtain even for those who live in sin today. Listen to Isaiah as he describes what Judah was really like back there. What their efforts were like when they were so hypocritical. He says, we are all as an unclean thing. That's what we are back here in this time in history. And everything we do, our righteousnesses, not the things God wants us to do, are nothing but menstrual rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our sins like the wind have taken us away. That's what we are. That's a description of an apostate nation. That's a description of someone who is living in sin and dead while he lives. 1 Timothy 5, 6. That is not a description of a Christian who may sin and decides he'd better ask God to forgive him because he's penitent about that. He's willing to confess it. He's willing to do what's right. We cannot describe him as apostate. But a person in an apostate situation, all he does is nothing more than a filthy rag. When I try to do my own works and please God, whatever I decide to do, it won't work. I must do the works of God. One of the works of God is faith, John 6, 28. One of the works of God is repentance, Acts 17, 30. One of the works of God is confession of the name of Christ before witnesses, Romans 10, 9 and 10. One of the works of God is to be immersed in water for the remission of sins, Acts 22, 16. And so it's the case that when I do those kinds of acts of righteousness, they're not my works. I can't boast about that. God told me to do it. When I am a Christian and I sin, I need to confess it, 1 John 1, 9. But if I become apostate, I'm dead while I live. Whatever I'm doing in that state, impenitent, is nothing more than a filthy rag. And back there in Judah, there was none that called upon his name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and has consumed us because of our iniquities. Isaiah says, I know what our problem is. So he confesses it here. He writes it down for us so we will not be in the dark about what Judah's problem was. Having been a person who was forgiven of sin, has been forgiven of sin, and ask God to forgive him now. It's hard for me to acquaint myself with those who just love to keep on sinning. We need a different kind of a heart as his people. But Isaiah finally says, But now, O Lord, thou art our Father. We are the clay, and thou art potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. God, you'll have to do with us because you're the one in charge. But don't be very sore with us, God. <laughs> Isaiah's begging. Verse 9, O Lord, there neither remember iniquity forever. Hopefully we can come out of this captivity, God, which they did. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. But we have no place to live. We understand that. We're going into captivity. Verse 10, Therefore, everything we have here will be done away. We understand that, verse 11. And God, will that be enough? Verse 12. Well, it will be enough, but they're still going into captivity. And the Gentile will be brought in, chapter 65, verse 1. I'm sought of them that ask not for me. Paul uses this verse in Romans 10, 20, and 21 to explain to the Jews of his day that the Gentile had been prophesied as coming into the church. Moses said it, Isaiah said it, he's, Paul says. And those people were sent. They were sent out. Their feet were beautiful. They were prophets. And they were sent with a message that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord should be saved. But not everyone believed that report. The Jews especially rejected that. 
God said, I spread out my hands all the day. All through history, I've spread out my hands to these Jews. But they walked in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. I reached out to them. They turned away from me. A people that provoketh me to anger continued to my face. When we studied the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy with our classes at the Memphis School of Preaching, we write down all the separate times that the Jews rebelled against God or murmured or complained. And there are ten distinct efforts, or ten distinct, distinct if, uh, times when the Jews rebelled that are mentioned in the book of Numbers alone. And in all of those ten occasions, there was punishment given because they murmured and complained. Well, their history is a history of complaining and provoking God and, and speaking against God. It was a history of idolatry, verse 3, that sacrificed in gardens, groves, and burneth incense upon altars of brick. These people were rebellious, he says. Why would I not turn to the Gentiles? Paul and Barnabas actually experienced that firsthand, preaching to the Jews, and the Jews rejected the message, and Paul said, since you rejected us, we turn to the Gentiles, Acts 13, 46. But the Jews remain among the graves, and lodge in the mountains, which eat swine's flesh, and broth of abominable things is in their vessels. Not only did they practice idolatry, they practiced the occult, they disobeyed the law of Moses, the law of God, Leviticus 11, 7, they ate swine's flesh, forbidden to them. 1 Samuel 28, 15, same idea. They practiced the occult. But the faithful are ordered to stay away from this kind of people. Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. You faithful people, get away from those unfaithful. Turn away from them. They are a stench to me, God says. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. I'm going to take care of these rebellious people. Your sins and your iniquities together, saith the Lord. You people who have practiced idolatry, blaspheme me in that effort to practice idolatry. I will measure that or former work into their bosom. What they sowed, they are going to reap in captivity. And thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake. Out of the dry ground of Judaism, the church will come in which the Gentile will be blessed. And anyone who is a Jew who wants to turn to the gospel will be blessed. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. God, again, has a purpose called the church, and all who are saved will be in it as the new wine is found in the cluster. A remnant is left. Out of all of this evil and this idolatry and this occult and this stench in God's nose, there is coming a people, His servants, and they will inherit His mountains, His governments. His elect shall inherit it. God voted for us in the Christ. The Holy Spirit told us about how to be elected and we cast the deciding vote to be elected. We decide whether or not we will obey the gospel. To come into this great new covenant, this great new church that's coming, that's our choice. And from east to west, people will be brought to this covenant. 
and Sharon in the east shall be a fold of flocks. Jesus spoke about being the shepherd of the new flock. And the valley of Achor to the west, a place for the herds to lie down and for my people that have sought me, a prosperous new nation, a prosperous new church is coming out of all this effort in history by God. Messiah will bring salvation. Messiah will be sacrificed to bring that salvation. The Jews have to be punished to get them in line so God can bring His promise to Abraham through their seed. And eventually, people who were not His people under covenant back there under the law of Moses, at the time that Mosaic, the Mosaic covenant was in force, those Gentiles will seek Him. Those of us who were not ever related to a Jew, who were born into a Gentile family, should rejoice that God had a plan to save all of us. Why, about, why are the Jews going to be left out? They forsook the Lord. They are they that forsook the Lord, that forgot the holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. A large number of idols was their problem. Therefore will I number you to the sword. You had a great number of idols, I'll number you to the sword. Notice justice. You shall bow down to the slaughter, because when I called you did not answer. When I spake you did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. As Isaiah comes to the end of his prophecy, he still has to admit and tell the people of his day what their problem is. And over and over and over again, this preacher, Isaiah, has told these people what it was that God was doing and why he was doing it. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. My servants shall drink, but ye, Judah, shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but ye, Judah, shall be ashamed. My servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye, Judah, shall cry for sore of heart, and shall howl for vexation of spirit. The, the faithful sing about this glorious church coming, but the remnant um, are the only ones that can sing this way. You there be that find it, my friend, and ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. Judah, I'm doing away with Judaism eventually. And the wicked will leave their name for a curse. Jeremiah 24, 9. And if you're going to be blessed on this, in this world, you'll have to bless yourself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten. There's a brand new situation. God says, all of that past history is hid from my eyes. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, a new situation. Just a figure of speech for a new situation. Not to be taken literally, as if there would be a new earth of some kind but a figure about a new situation, a figure about a future kingdom, a new place for our head and a new place for our feet. And the former Judaism will be done away, not come to mind anymore. But be ye glad and rejoice, for they were in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem, a rejoicing and her people a joy. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. I'm creating a new situation a new church, and it, and it won't have to do with worldly age or worldly situations. It won't be a place where you are an infant of days. You won't come in as a child, baby, nor an old man that hath not filled his days, for the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. In the new kingdom, life situations don't matter. Spiritual relationships to God do. And it's a prosperous new kingdom. They shall build houses and inherit them, inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. This new kingdom will be prosperous. It's a kingdom of people 
whose reward is in it, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, they won't build in another inhabit like the Jews did, building their houses and Babylon took them. They shall not plant in another eat as the Jews did when the Babylonians ate their gardens. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, Christian, for you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. They shall not labor in vain. Isaiah said this in the long ago. Paul repeated it to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Blessings for the new church, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And that it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, Matthew 6, 8. He knows our needs before we ask. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. And what a peaceful kingdom it is. Wolves can lie down with lambs in this kingdom. Figuratively speaking, it's a peaceful kingdom. The lion shall eat straw like the bullock. Well, that's an allusion to the Garden of Eden, where all of the mammals and all ate grain. No animal ate another animal back there until the fall. Adam and Eve, when animals became carnivorous. So we have a peaceful place like the Garden of Eden was when we come into the church. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all the whole of my holy mountain, saith the Lord. He takes us all the way back, Isaiah does, to Isaiah 2, 2 through 4, and reminds us this is a peaceful kingdom. It will start in Jerusalem, it will spread to the whole world, it will be a prosperous place for God's people, a place of blessing. When we go to worship on the Lord's Day, and when we're with the brethren, those with whom we will spend eternity, that peace is passing my understanding. In this world in which you and I live today of trouble and disease and difficulty and fear and hundreds of other problems, Church is our place of peace. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? God said, You can't build a temple big enough for me. I'm going to take care of that. For all those things hath mine hand made, and those all, all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look. You want to live in God's new temple, His church. You have to have a contrite spirit. Poor and contrite spirit. You need to empty yourself and tremble at the Word of God. God's temple is a contrite heart. God is with us. He's our God. He is with His people. And ritualism has no place in that kind of a relationship. Verse 3. I will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them. God said, I will decide for those who do not hear when I speak. I have chosen their end because I'm in charge. But those who hear the word of the Lord, those who tremble at His word, those who are hated by the unfaithful, glorify God in it. Blessed are ye when men revile you and speak all manner of evil against you for my name's sake. For so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. Isaiah says, in God's new church, God will appear to your joy. We don't want to be sacrificing lambs or anything else, or practicing idolatry. There's no ritualism here. It's a relationship. He will appear to our joy. It's individual between us and God in the new kingdom. And they, the unfaithful, will be ashamed. A voice of noise from the city. A voice from the temple. A voice of the Lord that rendereth recompense to His enemies. God's message. God through Despite the corruptness of Judaism, God's message got through 
And it brought forth with a man-child. It happened suddenly in history before her pain came. She's delivered of the child. This event of the coming of Messiah will happen suddenly in history. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? The church will be born in one day. Verse 8. One day, the day of Pentecost. And God said, Shall I not cause that? Verse 9. So rejoice. In this new kingdom, while I will extend peace to her like a river, I will bring her comfort. I will bring her providence and triumph. Verse 14. And I will bring her also fury to those who reject the message. Verse 15. Verse 15 is very much like Romans 11, 22. Behold the goodness and severity of God. In the message of the gospel, there are two sides to that sword. When I reject it, it still cuts my heart and, and causes it to be calloused. When I accept it, it pricks my heart and causes it to be soft. And so in the message that brings the new church, there is a message of sword and fire, but there is a message of sanctification, verse 17. And God said, I know the difference. I know their works and their thoughts, and I will gather all nations, and they shall come and see my glory, and I will set a sign among them. I will set a cross among them, a Christ among them, and they, Gentiles, will come in, and they will bring all their brothers an offering in this new church. And they will be my priests, verse 21, 1 Peter 2, 9. And as the new heaven and the new earth, figurative again, which I shall make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed. This is an eternal kingdom, this church of Christ, this new heaven and this new earth. And it's a case, it will be a new Jerusalem, and all flesh will come to worship, Jew and Gentile. And the new worshipers, the new worshipers will see the corruption that's in the world and be glad they're part of my new Sabbath, verse 24. We've come to an end of our study of the Messianic prophet Isaiah. I hope it has been beneficial to you, and also I hope it's been inspirational for us to know that 700 years before he ever came, Isaiah said, Jesus is coming, and he's bringing a new church, a new kingdom, a place of peace and of comfort for all people, for all generations. May God bless us in this study. Oh,